Welcome to the Monsters of Fantasy. This was written, produced, recorded, and edited by me, Sean McCarter. Monsters of Fantasy is a production in which I will explore the truly horrific side of the fantasy world known as Dungeons and Dragons. There are content warnings in the show notes below. Episode 5, Gibbering Mouther. Sorry if I don't sound too into it. We're going through the older portion of your studies, and I believe we found one of your more disturbing entries. Honestly, Cadewin and I were completely surprised something like this could exist. Or does exist. I don't know. Encounter with the Gibbering Mouther, as described by Joshua Cotevier. I hated being normal, I hated being plain and simple, and most of all, I hated being human. Okay, I admit hate is a strong word, and I actually loved my upbringing for the most part. Up until the age of 18 years old, I lived in a town called Lysander, just about eight days south of Voron. My parents had owned a small farm on the outskirts of the town, large enough to support ourselves. Any other items we needed came from the income that my mother made as the local seamstress. For the most part, my days were spent alongside my older siblings, tilling the fields, pulling up weeds, feeding farm animals, or anything that we really needed to get done to keep our little self-sustaining lives. It wasn't a bad life, but it was a rather boring one. I didn't really know what I was looking for back then. I was just going through the motions of everyday life, not really knowing that there could be more. That there was more. But that all changed when I met that mysterious Ganassi. I was hanging around old Mike's tavern like everyone else was that night, listening to the roving band that happened to be staying a few nights in our town. They called themselves Loose-Lipped Sinners, and their lead was a handsome elf that had such a warm but energetic voice that could captivate any crowd, and he did so while fastly plucking away at a lute. There was another young, handsome half-orc that played some kind of drums that hung around his neck, and truthfully the pair were energetic enough and outgoing enough that they were captivating our crowd immensely and were well enough earning their stay for that night. But instead of clapping and dancing along to the jovial pair, I found myself staring at the beautiful fire ganassi that was sitting alone by herself in the back of the tavern. I wasn't some weird human that had never seen another species before, but I will admit that the cloaked figure sitting in the corner captivated me. She was wearing a black shawl that covered her shoulders, but the hood was down so I could get a good look at her. She had long auburn hair that she had braided into a long, thick, single braid that would go down to her back, but instead she wore it bundled up in a bun. From the bun, tiny little embers were floating into the air, blinking out into the air above her. She sat there looking vaguely unamused at the band, her face cradled in her charcoal hands. I remember she just looked so beautiful. Her soft red eyes landed on me. Behind them I saw a beautiful dancing flame. She gave me a warm smile and I took that as an invitation to come over and talk to her. My parents had always said that I wasn't the smartest in the family. That was my oldest brother, Mikal. They also reminded me I wasn't the strongest or fastest. That was my middle brother, Kyle. But they always said I had a way with words, that I could talk my way out of or into any situation. So I took this confidence and I walked up to this beautiful woman. For someone who changed my life so drastically, I never even got her name. As soon as I sat down, she looked at me and asked if I had ever known a Ganassi before, let alone a fire one. Her voice sounded like a crackling fire, and with each word the faint scent of brimstone filled my nose. I admitted to her that no, I had never met someone as different as her, but that I would love to get to know her. And for the next thirty minutes we kind of half shouted at each other, bits and pieces of our lives, but the sounds of the tavern began to annoy us, and we decided to take a walk out into the night. 
I learned a lot about her that night. How she grew up inside the middle walls of Voron, a life that for the most part was a significant upgrade from mine. She had parents who were both in politics, by which I think she meant her parents were a part of the military, but I never asked to clarify. They gave her everything she could ever need and paid for her to have a formal education at the School of Arcane, located inside the main capital. However, she got bored of that life, and as soon as she felt like she had learned enough from the school, she left to start adventuring and had been doing so for about a year now. I then told her about life on the farm and about my day-to-day -day struggles of cleaning up animal feces, digging up weeds, and whether or not Bessie, our more aggressive cow, would let me milk her or not. She laughed at me, and we both bonded over how truly boring my life was. We spent the rest of the night walking through the town like that. She told me about some story of encountering some monster like a goblin during her travels, and then demonstrated the spell she had used on it. I would then accent the crazy arcane life she lived by pointing out some useless but cute fact about our town. Like how when we passed the mayor's building in the center of town, I told her a cute story about how my mother had made the wedding dress for his daughter Elizabeth. About three days before the wedding, one of our pigs had gotten into the house, and before eating out our entire pantry, it had also sampled the hem of the wedding dress. It was as I was finishing that story that I felt her warm fingers wrap around my hand. She pulled me closer to her, and then I felt her other hand gently rest itself on the back of my head. She was smiling softly at me and I noticed her eyes and hair were now glowing brighter than before. The soft embers had now turned into small flames that licked at the air around her. There was a dim glow centered around her making her look even more radiant and beautiful. She then leaned in and kissed me. I don't even know what her lips felt like. My lips only remember that searing, hot pain that shot through them as they split open from the overbearing heat. I felt her fingertips burn away my hair in an instant. They had now felt like white, hot needles burrowing into my scalp. In horror, I watched as blackened chunks fell away from my lips onto the ground. She pulled herself away, and dripping from the boiling wound on my face, I saw blood sizzling onto the ground. My mind went white with pain as I felt my face melt away. I woke up two days later inside the local church. It seemed that Father Donovan had noticed the incredibly bright light that flashed and came to my rescue. Say what you want about Father Donovan being a weird man for the company he keeps. He is a damn good healer. He said it cost him a fortune to pull it off, but, for the most part, my injuries were completely healed. I had a scar across my upper lip and my lower jaw, but thankfully it seemed my beard could still grow, so honestly it didn't bother me that much. Father Donovan told me it was free of charge and that I wouldn't have to worry about repaying him at all. I know it sounds like he's just being a good local priest, but it was because he thought Sparks had did it. He had recently adopted this local pyromaniac named Sparks, and since no one else was there to contradict him, I hadn't yet fully processed what was happening, and I didn't bother correcting him. I went back to the farm to a rather shocked family, but... I gave them the same story about not really remembering and that it had something to do with Sparks. That led into the truth about being healed and my disappearance for the past two days. One of my brothers had seemed to be a little more keen to press on than the others. He claimed he saw me with some girl who seemed like fire. I brushed it off at the time and said he was drunk that night and that this would now be the fourth serious injury that Sparks had caused. He seemed to accept it and everyone moved on. Except, they did so without me, because two days later I set out on my journey to become a powerful wielder of the arcane, despite my ancestry. There were tons of powerful wizards throughout history that were human. Sure, I hadn't ever shown a single aptitude for the arcane up until that point, but I wasn't going to let that stop me. I was so determined to become something more than a boring, normal human. So, over the next few months, I had made my way into Voron, the largest city in the entire country. 
and then I started to frequent every bookstore or library I could find. I made money by helping out on some local farms outside of the walls during the week, but on the weekends I would make my way into town and search throughout the many, many books. Admittedly, I had no idea what I was looking for. I was searching amongst fairy tales that read of magic, manuscripts that talked about the research of magic, even a few about the more ancient magics like druids and stuff. It was while I was in the middle of reading such a book that I met the next person who would change my life forever. The book was talking about how all magic, whether we see it as divine, arcane, or even druidic, can be accessed by any creature. But it was about accessing the energy that flowed around you. Honestly, I was starting to get lost and was going to move on to the next book when an older man who seemed to be in his mid to late fifties approached me. He wore a black half shroud that covered his all black robes. The robes draped all the way down to the floor covering up his feet. He did have a belt cinched at the waist, though it seemed to contain an assortment of what at the time I could only describe as herbs and animal byproducts. And in his hands was a book that was bound with old black leather. The book had no title and on the cover there was only a symbol of an eye, except it wasn't a human eye. It looked like the eye of a snake. The pages turned slightly as if someone were flipping through the ancient tome, but I could see that the old man wasn't turning the pages himself. I then felt him touch my mind. Would you like to learn magic? I then smelt the familiar smell of brimstone hit me, and without thinking I told the man yes. Over the course of the day, this man who called himself Merlin, no surname, went on about how magic could be attained by anyone, and that wizards all kept their secrets hidden inside their grimoires. He told me that I would never find the true answers in libraries and bookshops, because the wizards had a secret language that they all used to cast their spells. He then let me look into a spell book of his. All I could see were just the symbols that made no sense to me sprawled out along the old tattered pages. He then let me hold the book for a while, and I remember the leather feeling warm, and that every few pages I flipped through I saw burn marks that ate away at the edges. But I wasn't able to discern anything, and he told me that all I had to do was get me a spare spell book, because he couldn't let me have his, and then sign my name in the official wizard's registry. He had led me to an old abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of town at this point, and told me to sit tight and wait a while while he grabbed a spare book. He then walked into the back rooms of the warehouse and closed the doors behind him. I sat there alone for about ten minutes in silence, just trying to stop my heart from racing. I kept myself busy by trying to recite some of the spells the old man had demonstrated to me to help prove that he was indeed a real wizard. I started thinking about my potential name. Every great wizard has a cool name, you know. It was while I was toying with the idea of Colt Via the Great that Merlin returned to me now carrying two tomes. The one that was clearly meant for me looked to be the exact same as his, but was completely newer in every shape or form. There were no burn marks, the pages looked fresh and new, and all the stretched leather was even shades of deep black, making the book look as if it were just bound moments ago. He strode over, placing the book in my hands. He was saying something, but I was distracted yet again by the smell of brimstone. This time, it was definitely coming from the spell book I held in my hands. Before I could question him though, Merlin had already pulled a thick bound piece of parchment. It was a long list that contained very large words that I couldn't begin to make sense of. However, at the bottom I did see a place to sign. From behind the paper, Merlin's hand reached from underneath, handing me a jet black quill. He told me that all great wizarding contracts are signed in blood and that if I want to be respected amongst other wizards, I should sign in blood as well. I didn't really need much convincing. Before he could finish talking, I had already dug the pen across my forearm and signed on the dotted line. I didn't hesitate. I opened up the spell book I was cradling and stared at the foreign symbols as they started to dance across the page in front of my eyes. It was as if the symbols were hovering off the page of the book and danced playfully until they settled themselves back into place on the pages below. However, when they did so, I could now understand completely what they were telling me to do. 
I raised my hand and started reading the first line of the book that just read, Eldritch Blast. The words spilled from my lips as I held my hands outward, reading the page exactly. For a moment, I panicked, because nothing was happening and I felt a pit in my stomach form at the idea that I was just broken, that somehow I would never be able to cast magic. But from that same sinking feeling, I felt a surge of energy flow through me. I felt scared, honestly. It felt like I was about to vomit. But as I went back and retched in preparation, I saw dark red energy shooting out from my hands. Crackling, it smashed into the wall of the warehouse, crumbling away some of the brick. I then heard Merlin touch my mind once more. Let me teach you how to become more powerful than you can imagine. And that was our relationship for the next year. He taught me how to use and control the words that were contained in the book. It eventually got to the point that most of the common things he taught me, I no longer needed to read the book to cast them. However, it seemed that the later half of the book had not yet translated itself to me, and that some of the more advanced arcane spells were still hidden. When I confronted Merlin about it, he said it was a safety measure that wizards put on the arcane contracts of their spell books so that some idiot doesn't destroy the world by trying to cast a spell beyond what they can control. Sure enough, after a few months of practicing with Merlin, and doing some small adventures of gathering materials, more of the book began to slowly reveal itself to me. The one thing they don't tell you in a lot of those fairy tale books about wizards is the vast majority of components we have to keep finding, and hunting, in order to use our spells. I guess those books would be a lot less fun to read if every time the wizard wanted to disappear, they first had to chew some bubble gum and pluck out an eyelash. What I'm getting at is most of the time I spent with Merlin was out exploring the world, learning and gathering in person, not just sitting around and doing nothing. We were on one such exploration when my life would change for the third and final time. Merlin had heard a tip that there was a powerful ring that was buried alongside some long-forgotten war chief. I wasn't too keen on going down into some temple to rob someone's grave, but apparently it was a ring of fire resistance, and I have to admit that even after almost two full years later, I couldn't stop thinking about meeting her again. I knew that if I could get the ring, or even at least borrow it from Merlin, then maybe she and I could have a relationship. So, that's how I found myself creeping down the corridors of a long and forgotten burial ground, about 30 feet below the earth. It should have been dark, but Merlin said one of the benefits of binding with the spell book is you gain the ability to see in the dark, you know, in case you need to read your books at night. He kind of chuckled and said that he liked to call it Devil's Sight due to it even working in darkness created through the arcane means. This meant that the trip down wasn't too bad and neither of us needed any torches. But, unfortunately, sight didn't really help me, because I managed to hear the thing first. Being the only ones down there, when I heard what I can only describe as a bag full of meat being drug across stone, I froze and pressed myself against the wall. Merlin was behind me and gave me a look letting me know he too heard the sound. Faintly under the wet sound of meat, I heard clicking, or should I say, chattering. Before we could back out to safety, whatever this thing was had already turned the corner and was advancing towards us. And I say thing, for that's all my mind can comprehend calling the horror I witnessed. It stood about ten feet tall and ten feet wide, but that didn't really matter because the shifting form of this thing was stretching and pulling beyond what any normal creature could do. It was oozing itself towards us, and I saw the ground underneath begin to melt and bubble as it inched its way closer. I heard Merlin shouting behind me to run, but I couldn't move. I was paralyzed in fear because I could now clearly see hundreds of mouths covering this creature. And I knew the creature could see me too, for it even had more eyes than mouths covering its pink fleshy ooze. All the eyes rotated in unison. Some looked like human eyes, some avian, some reptilian. However, they were all looking at me. And then, in an insane chorus of agony and pleasure, all the mouths began screaming 
as the creature slowly crawled towards me. I couldn't move because the torrent of noise had clouded my mind and all I could do to stay standing was clutch at my skull in some vain attempt to stop the sound from reaching through to my ears. I felt something grab my arm and in a panic I swung my small dagger I kept on me at Merlin and he started bleeding. I hadn't meant to harm him, I was just scared and thought the creature had already begun attacking me, but I was still 15 feet away from it and I could see it inching slowly towards me down the corridor. I saw the largest of its mouths open, inside of which were just more eyes and mouths that got lost in the blackness of its throat. From the blackness, however, I saw a green glow begin to force its way out. Before I could shield my eyes, the creature had already coughed up whatever it was and spat it at me. At first I was relieved, thinking it had missed. But as the glob of spit impacted with the floor beneath me, it exploded in a bright white light. I was blinded and could not see anything. I heard the sounds of footsteps behind me and tried turning to run, but my legs would not move. This time not from fear, but because my boots had already been melted by the creature fusing me to the spot. I then felt a dozen or so small mouths start shredding away at the muscles on my calf. I felt myself falling and blindly tried to catch myself with my hands only to find my right hand squishing and sliding in between what I could only hope was an eyelid. My left hand wasn't so lucky because I felt it cram into the oozy flesh of the creature and from inside I could feel tiny teeth moving towards my hand. I could feel whatever this thing was made out of was slowly burning away the flesh that still hung on to my arm. It was in that blinding white light I was slowly dissolving away that I remembered the last time I had this experience. The pain now though was much greater as I felt all the fat and muscle quickly dissolve away from my body. I was still blinded, but I didn't need my eyes to know that the creature already wrapped its massive body around me. I could feel teeth protruding from thousands of different angles pulling away melting flesh from bone. All thoughts of that gorgeous woman started to fade from my mind, and the only thing I could see and focus on was the blinding hot pain that surrounded me. I wanted to let out a scream so badly, but I couldn't find my mouth. Then the whiteness started to fade, but the pain did not. I saw Merlin standing in front of me, running away in horror. I don't know why he was running away. All I know is I want to consume. Statement attached from previous records. I knew of Merlin and his apprentice at the time and was actually following them to see if they would uncover anything interesting. In part, I was right, and they proved rather useful. Even though I was not able to make it in time to save Mr. Coltvier, I did arrive soon enough to save Merlin and get his statement. I have attached to this the main encounter, however, because of the nature of this creature, when I cast at my spell, multiple accounts were pulled. I discarded most of them, but kept the few that will help in my research. Then, in a separate bundle that Luna found two days later, were the rest of the encounters that were taken from that... thing. Gibbering Mouther Physiology. I guess it's a fitting name considering it's just a monstrosity that consists of mouths and eyes. I can't begin to understand how something like this exists. I read your notes about how it was some mutated human who didn't know what type of magic they were working with and turned themselves into this monstrosity. Despite the numerous encounters about the creature, it seems that this creature has only been encountered as three separate beings. Not enough to be worried about, but enough that Nico said... It probably isn't a coincidence. We believe this creature comes from some far-off disgusting realm, maybe one where oozes are more mutated. The body of the creature acts and behaves very similar to other oozes, but is composed of a more volatile and explosive substance. The mouther, as everyone around the castle has started calling it, is an amorphous mass that consists of dissolved remains of its previous prey. Like most creatures without limbs, brains, or an exoskeleton, it seems to only act on instinct 
and moves very, very slowly. The creature has no natural weaknesses or resistances, but we still do not recommend you try and encounter this creature if you see one because of its abilities. The first of which isn't really anything the Malva can control. It seems that the chemicals that help break down and dissolve their prey also break down the terrain that surrounds the gibbering Malva. Surrounding the creature you'll find the ground starts to fall and give way as whatever terrain the Malva rests on starts to dissolve. This ends up acting like a pseudo-quicksand and causes anybody nearby a great difficulty in running away. The Malva also has the ability to generate an explosive chemical and then hurl it at its prey. The explosive itself isn't actually lethal, but causes a bright flash of light that it uses to blind its target. That paired with the incoherent gibbering of the monstrosity, you'll quickly find yourself disoriented like Mr. Kotvia. And just like the many victims before, it will use its many mouths to bite you, and attempt to assimilate you into its mass. Look, this part is for you, Nico. You can cut the rest out of this recording, but I feel I have to say this. You've collected all of these accounts from these people only to care about the monsters they speak of, not the people in them. Granted, I don't know this Joshua fellow, nor Merlin, but Liz. I knew Liz before that evil necromancer had destroyed Lysander. Sparks. I knew Sparks. He wasn't some lines and some pages to be tossed in your collection of words. He was a real human being. Oh, um, come in. Hey, are you done recording? Uh, yeah, why? What's up? Nico just arrived downstairs. Oh. Oh. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Monsters of Fantasy. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share with your friends and family. Check the links in the description to follow us on social media where we post about upcoming episodes. This episode was inspired by one of my earlier player characters who was so dumb he didn't realize he was a warlock. Join me next week as Kezvar keeps learning more and more about the all-powerful Nico. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.